To understand Daddy, you must first understand where he lived. He grew up in the marsh country along the eastern shoreline of the Chesapeake Bay, a wet and windy land of shallow ponds and winding creeks that reached through thousands of acres of waving sedges and cattails and finally touched the dry land above the tide line. Daddy loved the marsh. To say that the marsh influenced the lives of those who lived along its rim would be a colossal understatement. The marsh absolutely dominated their lives. Well, you can't describe them uh, in simple terms because their career was so long. I mean, it extended from roughly 1918 when they made their first decoys and all the way up to 1980. So. They, uh, their styles changed dramatically over that time period. And uh, if someone did a description of them from the 20s, it would have been different from the 1930s, and it would have been different in the 40s when they started using different material and different designs, and then they got into the decorative mode in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, where they were dramatically different from the way they began. Lemuel and Stephen Ward, two brothers rooted in the community life of Crisfield, Maryland, brought wildfowl carving to a place of prominence in American art history and national attention to their waterfront community. The quality, functionality, and beauty of their decoys attracted thousands of admirers to Lem and Steve's shop. Their early life experiences and the community of which they were a part set the stage for their future success. Lem and Steve drew a great deal of know-how from their father, Travis Ward Sr., both occupationally and artistically. Their father was a waterman through and through. I mean, he, he made his living off of the water, and that's the way the boys were raised. The decoys were a very small part of what Travis Ward did. Mostly he was fishing, and he was clamming, and he was hunting, and he was a, a typical waterman in a, in a remote, out-of-the-way place in America down that dirt road to, to Crisfield back in his day. In the marsh country, a man's success was measured by the bushel. The more bushels a man pitched up on the wharf from his boat, the greater his stature with the community. As a barber and carver, Daddy never ranked very high. This was illustrated by an incident that occurred one day as he was walking along the road towards the creek, carving on a small block of wood. A waterman stopped him and asked him what he was doing. Daddy replied that he was making a duck head. For that, the waterman soundly reprimanded him. Here you are a grown man, wasting your time whittling. You ain't never going to amount to nothing. They were barbers, as we have said. They cut hair. Now, in a, in a watering community where most people worked um, on the water or worked hard, during the day, they had a lot of time, and they did uh, uh, have time to carve. And they worked a lot of times in the evenings. The barber shops would stay open late in the evenings, and, and Saturdays was when they were busiest. But most of the time, when they went to sweep the barber shop, the floor was mixed with hair and cedar chips, cedar shavings from where they had been working. He used a hatchet, and he was an artist with a hatchet. Uh, I, uh, I, could, I still this day, I don't understand how he did it, but when he finished a, a decoy and gave it to Lem to paint, Lem looked it over and he had to do little or no sanding. Now that's difficult to believe with a sharp tool, but that's actually what happened. Uh, it, it was an embodiment of art. That's all I can say is he was a true artist. And then if you go to the painting side, Lem was the painter and was, and was better with the brush than almost anybody. The stippling paint where, you, where he um, a achieved a, a depth of, uh, of color in, in the solid color and a texture um, was copied by many people. He, um, he, he learned how to to find feathering in a unique way with very small, short strokes. He would actually outline a feather with small, short strokes. But he, he was an artist with the brush. And um, uh, clearly, he, he set a standard that others tried to meet over time. 
He mixed his paints in clam shells, oyster shells, so he knew exactly how he was blending paint, blending two colors in the shell. When it came off the brush, it was more than one color, and he would he he called it pulling feathers rather than painting feathers. There's no question that Lem's handicap with his left hand probably influenced him more towards carving than uh, we'll ever know because he was a waterman at heart who couldn't do a lot of the waterman type things that uh, many of his neighbors and friends could do. And carving and p painting was something that he could do and, uh, and could do, do successfully. So you can imagine, you can try to imagine the work that he did working with that left arm as he did. So, and if you look at some of the uh, birds, uh, he didn't paint under the bill because he, it was hard for him to hold it in his left hand. As the workload increased, Steve and Daddy began to feel stress and frustration. When Daddy felt like he needed a diversion from working on decoys, he would turn to painting on canvas. He called this flat work, and it seemed to refresh him. He always had a painting in progress. When he first began, he painted flowers and kittens and dogs, but as the years passed, he began to concentrate on his first love, wildfowl. He never considered himself an artist, for he never thought that his paintings were good enough. But then again, he was never satisfied that anything he did was good enough. Early on, the Ward brothers had sold most of their decoys to local watermen, hunters, and guides. By the mid-1930s, the Wards were selling their decoys to the many hunt clubs that lured affluent people from growing cities to remote marshes across the country. These clubs placed orders for huge quantities of Ward decoys, often several hundred at a time. Ward decoys were exceptional in many ways, succeeding in attracting both ducks from a distance and the eyes and attention of the people who saw them. In 1948, Ward decoys swept every category that they entered in the New York Decoy Show, setting the stage for their future success at competition for years to come. Business was booming. Around 1965, the barbershop closed its doors, and the pair reopened their business as L.T. Ward & Brother, Wildfowl Counterfeiters in Wood. A year later, the Baltimore Sun featured them as the cover story in its Sunday magazine. There's no rush. He's already a year and a half behind in filling orders that come from everywhere. Orders he stuffs into corrugated paper boxes with the filing system of a pack rat. So why hurry? Besides, to do a bird properly, the way he insists on doing it, takes months. Consequently, he has no patience with people who try to prod him into a citified pace. A woman came in here not too long ago and ordered a bird, he relates. I told her I'd drop her a card when it was done. A few days later, she called and asked me whether it was done or not. I told her it wasn't, and I canceled the order. There's fur and feathers and copper and brass and everything else in those tubes of paint, but it takes a lot of time to get them out. Neither of them had any education, and they claimed that they were dumb old country boys. Lem would uh, say that uh, he couldn't talk, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't write, but yet he would write a letter that would make you cry. He'd bring tears in your eyes sometimes when you get a letter from them. And uh, they were interested in poetry, quoted poetry, uh, wrote poetry, particularly Steve. Steve wrote poetry. Uh, Lem recited it constantly. I'm just an old has-been decoy. No ribbons have I won. My head, sides and head are full of shots from many a blazing gun. My home has been a, on the river, just drifting along with the tide. No roof is I for shelter, no place I could abide. I have rocked to winter's fury, I have scorched in the heat of the sun. I have drifted, drifted and drifted, for tides never cease to run. I was picked up by some fool collector who put me on a shelf. But my place is out on the river where I can drift all by myself. I want to go back to the shoreline where flying clouds hang thick and low and the touch of the raindrops 
and the velvety, soft touch of the snow. When the sun come up, they'd sit there, and, and when we'd be just in the blind by ourselves, and he'd talk about how beautiful the sun was, and uh, he could tell what, kind, what, what species a duck was while he was flying, because he always said there's no two ducks alike, just like people. There's, if you look real close, you'll find a difference in every one that you shoot whether it be all mallards or what. By the time uh, they got a little 60s in their 60s or so, they got so they didn't want to kill anything. Uncle Steve would go down and just sit in a blind and watch the ducks go by. Attention and accolades were accumulating. The two brothers were featured in National Geographic three times in their lifetime. Locally, they were awarded honorary doctorates by Salisbury State College in 1972. The Ward Foundation was established in 1968, and the Ward Museum was established the year Steve died, 1976. By then, Lem was already shining as a solo artist through his decorative carvings and continued to create work that stretched his abilities as his own health declined. In 1983, Lem Ward won the National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Fellowship before his death the following year. Too ill to attend the ceremonies, Lem prepared a statement to be read to the audience. Whatever good I have done in my 86 years, I owe to others. First, to my father, who understood that a young boy's curiosity can be shaped with love and patience. Second, to nature, which has provided me the greatest studio and the most perfect models any artist may ever imagine. And last of all, to God, who taught me that faith is the foundation of all knowledge. Through all three, I have learned that man has the power both to destroy and to create beauty. And since there can never be too much beauty in the world, man's correct choice is eternal. Lemon Steve Ward's legacy remains alive through the artistic record they left for all to enjoy. Their art, legacy, and story are continued today through the work of two organizations, the Crisfield Heritage Foundation, and the Ward Foundation. The Crisfield Heritage Foundation preserves and showcases the Ward Brothers' original workshop on Sacratown Road for visitors to see and experience the unique place where the brothers created their magnificent decoys. The Foundation's museum also exhibits an impressive collection of original Ward carvings. The Ward Foundation was established during the brothers' lifetime to preserve their legacy. Operating the Ward Museum of Wildfowl Art in Salisbury, Maryland with Salisbury University, the organization showcases the Ward Brothers' story and carvings alongside an extensive collection of antique decoys and contemporary wildfowl carvings. Both organizations offer educational experience and programs that reveal the story of Lemon Steve Ward through the natural and cultural environment which shaped their art. Good.